Hello again, uh, this is Charlie Guelli, and we're happy today to be talking with Bob DeLuca of the group for the East End. Thank you, Bob, for Thanks coming. For uh, could you tell us a little bit more about the East End, the history and uh, the mission, and, and uh, something about uh, your background? Sure. So, um, with respect to the organization, if you go back to 1972, when the Long Island Expressway and the Sunrise Highway both kind of reached the East End, there was a sense that Western Long Island was going to follow. And so, those issues and the rapid reduction in farmland and conversion to development on the South Fork started this organization, really it was a handful of people, it was a blend of farmers and baymen, and second homeowners and residents, that became the first board of directors. And the one thing that they um, all agreed on right away, to this day, is we have to have a professional level of staffing to go up against what's coming, right? And they, I don't think they were wrong. So, you know, the organization was formed with that idea, and then from there, the mission developed really in three ways. One is you know, we advocate for the protection of the environment, and we do that through the hundreds of planning, zoning, local land use uh, processes that determine the future of the community. We get involved prospectively in trying to come up with ideas to you know, sort of support conservation. The Community Preservation Fund is an obvious one. We worked on that for about 12 years along with, with other people. To have a coalition that would um, create a long-term funding stream for land acquisition. That's just one kind of example. We work on state legislation and other things. And then education and, uh, and, and really like hands-on activities. So whether it's beach cleanups or habitat restoration or we're I think about 70% of the schools, of South Fork, North Fork. So all of those things help us achieve the mission of protecting the natural resources and trying to instill a conservation ethic for future leaders. You know, so young people who are gonna be running our town boards and our planning boards have some sense as to what's here and why it's important. So that's the base of the organization. My background, I started out in life as a, as a kind of hard science guy, and I was interested in ecology and, and studying um, natural environments. I went out to grad school and I realized that there was an awful lot of people doing that already, but the outcomes weren't happening because we didn't have people to transition scientific understanding and policy. So I went down the policy track, and I've been doing that ever since. So before I got to the group, um, I worked at the county health department in the Office of Ecology for about eight years, and I was a field biologist and an analyst, and now I do this for the last 31 years. <laughs> Is it fun? It. You know, it's, it, every day it's interesting. It's not the same, you know, if you like work that changes every day, you got it in this work, you know, because whether it's you get a phone call and something needs attention, or you're at a planning board meeting, or you're, you know, meeting with civics or something like this, it's always different, which I really like. The challenge is if you're in this business, you tend to, everything you see, you see something that maybe could be fixed or maybe could be better. And like my family doesn't like to ride in the car with me because I'm looking at that and I'm looking at that and they're like, we know. Because you say every time we go by here, so just drive and <laughs> uh, So from that standpoint, it can be a little rough. Um, and then at the end of the day, I think it's just, it's kind of great to work with so many people. I mean, here in the North Fork, South Fork, community civic organizations, fantastic. And people volunteer their time. They don't have to do any of this. You know, I'm fortunate. I'm a paid employee. I'm a salaried professional, and this is my job, and I love it. But the idea that people turn out for hearings and show up at meetings and spend their evenings working together to make their community better, to make government work, you know, it's humbling every day to this minute, having done it for all these years. Every time I'm involved in that stuff, I'm just amazed. So that's me. I've uh, I've heard you speak a few times, and uh, you, you're very knowledgeable and very articulate, and I, I love hearing you talk, actually. I like going to your talks. And you seem to have an in-depth uh, understanding of how uh, the agencies at South Hole Town work. Can you explain how your focus on environmental issues involves the various town boards? Yeah, it's it tends to be kind of similar in this respect, that, and a lot of folks don't really recognize this, but about 90% or 95% of your community, the way it looks, has to do with the decisions that are made in, in local town halls, not the federal government, not the state government. It's the hundreds of planning, zoning, and land use decisions that get made over time. And the town board is the top of the pyramid. So the town board sets policy, the town board sets zoning, what you can and can't do with the land. And working with town boards and trying to get the right policy so you're at least aimed in the right direction allows all the subordinate land use boards to have direction and guidance. And then you can go in, you know, now that we have a comprehensive plan here in Southold, 
Took us 11 years to get there, but you know what? Listen, it was citizen driven. I think the outcome has been very good, and I think you can, sh you know, you can remind the planning board members, zoning board members, members of the board. This is what people said they wanted. So we're not just in here going, yeah, you know, that was a good idea, and now we have another good idea. This was, you know, this was aged over time, and uh, I think we did it the hard way, which is the citizens came together on and on and on to, to try to get this this document across the finish line, which we did in the middle of COVID. And it's a credit to the town board for getting it done. And now, of course, the real work starts, which is taking that document and turning it into land use decisions. So our, our role, I think, in some ways is to try to facilitate what it is that the community and the town says it wants to do through the various boards that do those decisions. And sometimes you have to remind boards, and sometimes there are people pushing back, and sometimes there are developers pushing back. And we just want to make sure that those things that can't speak for themselves have a voice in these decisions because what most of us love about this place are those resources that can't speak for themselves in town hall, right? So you love the beach, you love the woods, you love the wetlands, you go kayaking or whatever it is. If all of those plants and animals could speak, I could very happily never show up to work again and things would be fine. But they can't. So that's up to us and you know community organizations and so forth. And that's the balance because it is, it is different than a specific economic interest to get a particular outcome on a particular piece of property. That's a narrow interest. It can be valuable, it can be important, but it has to be balanced against the community's wider interest and the wider interest of the resources that we rely upon as citizens here. You know, we, we drink from the, the water that's beneath our feet. You know, we're, we're, we're 70 miles out in the ocean from New York City, surrounded by water. There's a lot of, this is a vulnerable landscape and you tend to just think of it as home. You know, it looks like other places, it's got a road, you go to your driveway, you go to your house. But this is a thin end of the wedge here. And it can only take so much. So part of it is how do we minimize the human footprint that we leave behind on this place for our kids and our families so we can sustain it. You know, and it's not just like, oh, we just like it to be a certain way because that's our opinion this week. I mean, we need this ecosystem to function for our settlement to function. You know, and I think places like South Hold, Shelter Island, you know, that's very much an issue. There's not a ton of infrastructure coming from space that's going to fix all of this. So, you know, we have to treat it gently. Are there uh, any specific issues or projects that you and the group for the East End are working on right now? Well, South Hold's gotten very interesting lately. There's a lot going on. Um, you know, I mean, right now on the, on the aspirational side, we're working alongside at least a hundred other organizations for the preservation of Plum Island as a national monument, which would be a fantastic, you know, adaptive reuse of that property um, in a conservation-minded way. And trying to figure out how to make that happen, the facility will close. It will move uh, to Kansas. And originally, some of you, know, you may recall, it was it was on deck to be auctioned off to the highest bidder. Uh, the town, to its credit, uh, got in there and said, if it goes, it's going to have very strict zoning on it. That really helped. Then later, the ferry dock property was rezoned, so that could be lightly, you know, developed if at all. And now the theory is, you know, can we get the feds interested enough here to save this fantastic resource? And if you've been out there from the lighthouse to Fort Terry, the natural resources, and it's one of the biggest seal haulouts on the eastern seaboard. There's all kinds of reasons to want to protect it. So we think a national monument designation is appropriate for that. We're making progress. It's one of the rare things where there doesn't seem to be a lot of division with respect to the politics on it. You know, Lee Zeldin was a supporter of this Chuck Schumer, so that's great, that helps us. You know, uh, Congressman Lolota's in the same place. So uh, that's aspirational. On the reactive side, you know, we have in Mattituck now this large hotel resort complex on the Cardinale property that's coming in. It's big, 120 odd units, half a million square feet of, uh, of development. It's a busy corridor for traffic. You know, that project's got to be carefully looked at. We're just concerned as, you know, it's funny because so often it's like, what's the scale and magnitude of what you're building? Now, somebody would say, well, there's already something there, and I agree with that. So if you wanted to adaptively redevelop that property, okay. But to make it bigger than it was and add other parts to it and take down the woods and the forest, that's probably not what the comprehensive plan wants. So they're in the process. I think we're all going to have a look at it. I know that you all had... Um, uh, the developer come out and uh, was able to ask questions and provide more information, which is really important. So that's a big project. It's I think it's regionally significant given its size and its location. And I think it may have precedential uh, effects because of what it is and because 
I just spent 10 years and I'm still working on another resort development in East Quad, which is substantially larger, 600 acre piece of property, uh, you know, 100,000 square feet of retail spa, it's got 137 units, 18 whole golf course, all of which the developer came in and said it's really just a subdivision. So I'm in court on that matter because I don't think it's just a subdivision. Because if I went there, I would have to pay money for my hot stone massage, and I can't do that in my subdivision where it has a tennis court. You know, so the the description of what's a customary amenity is one of those areas which is starting to expand. So if these guys are successful, what they've been able to do is to say, okay, we got the subdivision, and then we got the pools, and then we got the tennis courts. And then we get 100,000 square feet of other stuff, which includes dining for 200 people, and a bar, a restaurant, theater. And it's just an amenity. It's just a customary amenity, like you would have in your subdivision. I'm like, that's not so. Like, that's not the way it works. But they, you know, they, they've persuaded the boards that this is fine, and so we're challenging that in court. Um, but that's why these precedential, these large projects can have precedential nature. Also in South Oak, we have the Strong's uh, Marine proposal, the Matatuck uh, Inlet there, proposal for large, two roughly acre in size boat warehouses, which require you to kind of mine away um, the existing landscape there, which people actually live around. And if you take, you know, the town of Riverhead has suddenly realized that this means that there's going to be a ton of traffic. If you were to mine this area out, it's, you know, several thousand trucks back and forth. You know, if you think of it in terms of like 20-yard dumpsters, you're talking about like 6,000 20-yard dumpsters of, 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 of earth just going away. And this is going to be an interesting one because it comes down to a question of what is the town prepared to accept as okay. And in other words, can you just mine the bluffs? Can you just mine away everything? You know, can you can you build a project because you have the zoning and eliminate these natural features, which in this case also happen to be people's backyards and so forth. And it's a you know it's a big project. And look, the storms they do a great job. They have nice marinas. It's, it's about what's the town's position and policy and how do they enforce that policy on a very sensitive, unusual piece of property. The upland part of this property is very narrow. It has a, I mean, the, the easier, accessible part. Then it has this large, you know, kind of bluff or, you know, geologic feature. And we're just, and to just take that away, I don't think I've seen that before. And so that one of the things that we work with is this law called the State Environmental Quality Review Act, which gives agencies the power to sort of uh, navigate environmental mitigation versus zoning versus a project sponsor's proposal, versus alternatives. And if you do it the right way, you can, you know, you can probably find some middle ground. But that's a big project, there's no doubt about it. Um, and it's going to have an effect on those people who live around there forever, there's no doubt about that. And the owner of the property also has rights that they you know, are trying to exercise. So, you know, it's a balancing act. I find a lot of it's like, you know, a lot of it's like getting along with people. Like, you always have to navigate, depending on where you are and who you're talking to, in the context of where that person is, right? So if they have no, if you, if you can't meet on any level, you know, you're really just talking past each other. So projects like these, to the extent that the community is involved, to the extent that the town is really involved, to the extent that organizations like ours are helping to provide data and information, you know, whatever the outcome is, I think you're in better shape uh, than if you just kind of let it go on its own. And most of us who got here from what, across Western Long Island to get to Eastern Long Island have a very strong experience of what it looks like when the development is not well controlled. You, uh, the town recently had a uh, restriction on uh, putting new docks in the bay. Uh, would you uh, address the purpose and what your thoughts are on the effect of this restriction? So I think, uh, again, one of the things to look at here, and I went back and I, I looked at the, uh, the comprehensive plan. And so the comprehensive plan says pretty specifically that the town is trying to limit the overall number of docks over time, you know, in the Peconic Estuary, the long story show there, and, and on the South Lakes. And so this, this law, which basically says, okay, new residential docks in many areas are not going to be permitted anymore. Um, and that sounds like, you know, pretty substantial, except when you take a look at an aerial and you see how many residential docks there are. I believe that the intent, and I don't disagree with this in any way, is to try to protect what remains of the shoreline habitat that is not either bulkheaded or hardened or in some way manipulated. And part of that is, is to try to get a handle on what sea level rise is likely to do to all of these um, nearshore ecosystems, right? So if you have a, a bed of seagrass and the water continues to rise and the water continues to come in and that seagrass, you know, is 
in, in a natural environment, the wetlands would migrate in, right? You would get more wetlands further up because the water's coming. That can't happen with, a, with an armored shoreline. And docks, like bulkheads, sometimes also create this like ricochet effect during storm events that can tear up, you know, um, coastal vegetation and those sort of nearshore ecosystems. So there's an effort by that, by, those, by that rule to try to protect kind of what's left of the natural shoreline. I think there'll be some positive benefits with respect to managing for sea level rise. I think there's a lot of docks in the town that will be here for a very long time. And I don't know the exact number of properties that would be affected, but you know, one of the things, and it's so funny because where I grew up, I grew up in Connecticut, and uh, I grew up in an area where people didn't put nearly the amount of time and energy and, and, and funding into their properties they do on Long Island. Like I've learned that. So whether it's fertilizers or whether it's docks or whether it's bulkheading, like I just, you know, and maybe people didn't have the resources. I don't know. But like, so I just grew up, and it was like, okay, the, the water's over there, and the house is over there, and like. You just get used to it. You know, it's not like I'm going to put in a half a million dollar bulkhead. I mean, it's just we do a lot on Long Island, and I'm not judging it. I'm saying it, it's different, but the but the legitimate problem is once you put all of that stuff in, that, all that architecture, whatever, it's a dock bulkhead, you're then obligated to try to protect it, keep it there. Don't we get that? Well, when sea level rise comes up and storms come up and they increase. That's great that you feel that way, but the reality is the earth has a different opinion. And so we have to start to learn how to manage. And, you know, starting by simply saying, look, we're just going to not have any more of these types of docks is a one way to do it. Now, there may be, you know, concerns about that. And I get that. You know, people have to figure out what that means in practice. But the town is right to try to figure out how to get a little bit ahead of this thing. Or the, the bottom line is, whatever the cost is going to be to manage the future of sea level rise, whatever that number is, it will only increase by every piece of architecture, infrastructure, building, and construction that we have in the way of the water when it comes in. And everybody will complain about that. But so, you know, I, and again, being an elected official, you know, it's funny in this business because a lot of times people think advocates just like that I really love like going and wagging my finger at elected officials all the time. I gotta tell you, I am like, I think I am probably more sympathetic than people realize to what it takes to try to run anything, much less a town with all the different opinions and limited resources and people asking you, you know, one person wants to have a stop sign someplace, somebody else has got a problem with this, something else, you know, you got the you got police issues to deal with, you have traffic. And you know, you get these jobs and you're like, I want to help my community. Probably six months in, you're wondering what you're thinking. But, um, so I really am sympathetic to that and I think that even if I, if I don't agree or I'm having a problem with a particular point of view, I get it, you know, I get it, it's tough. And look, I mean, in a weird way, I'm sort of in a similar, I mean, I get calls every day from tons of people that think I should fix or do or change or whatever it is, and there are things that I physically cannot do. Like, I'm not a government agency and there are things that I don't control and I'm, you know, scraping by on a nonprofit budget. And people are like, I can't believe you guys. Like, why did you do this? I'm like, well, that would cost like $80 million, which I don't have and I can't, and they're like, you guys are terrible. So I get it, you know, so I'm, try, I'm sympathetic. At the same time, I think most people that get elected, and, and I gotta tell you this, I always like with Scott Russell, because I think this guy, honestly, I think this guy, you know, he, he does like nine people's work, right? he really does, right? And he's, he, he really tries all over the place to, to get stuff to happen. And again, the other board members do, but when you're the supervisor, you have the target, right? You're the supervisor of the town, the target is on you, you're the full-time guy. And, uh, you know, I respect people in that position greatly. So whether I agree or disagree all the time, they always have my respect because it is hard to figure out what to do. And climate change is, you know, um, it's, it's leaps and bounds in some ways ahead of like where the things are we used to manage, like what's the side yard setback between you and your neighbor. You can't really figure out exactly how high it's going to get and exactly when it's going to happen and when the frequency of increased storms are going to be it's going to be your turn to get three in a row or whatever it is. Or those, what those levels mean over time or how that affects saltwater intrusion and how that affects uh, drinking water infrastructure and how the drinking water infrastructure affects growth inducement. And you're asking these people that we don't pay so much you know, to do this job and then killing them every time something happens that we don't like. You know? So <laughs> I have great sympathy. Nonetheless, um, we all got to try. And I think that's like that's the way I look at it. You know, I went to school with a lot of guys who were interested in this kind of thing, and most of them didn't last. Uh, and I tell people this all the time. And part of it was, and call me weird, but 
My expectation is that things change, they only change in two ways. One is they incrementally change over time, so you get a little bit, you get a little bit, you get a little bit, one day you wake up and it's better. Or there's a catastrophic, something happens and then everybody wakes up. And the, the catastrophic one is a great risk because sometimes it doesn't break in the interest of the thing you want, you know, you don't know what's gonna happen. So I favor incremental change over time because I think that's what most of us can manage. And I look at it that way. And I think it's allowed me to stay positive in this business because I know that everything takes 10 times longer than you think it should take. Everything that's supposed to happen this way happens that way. But if you're okay in that environment, you can sustain, you know, you can sustain change over time. And I think for civic organizations, it's really important to realize that, that, you know, the best ideas still take a long time to stick. And uh, I used to, I, I taught at Warren University for a number of years. And, you know, the students were like, okay, we're just going to go and, you know, take, take the buildings over. And, you know, and I get it. And I used to say two things. One is, if I knew what to do the next day, I'd be with you. But you actually got to run the place. Trust me, it's a little more complicated, right? And the other thing is that when you do that, you often create a backlash of people that are, that are terrified of that level of change that quickly. And you now have created a bunch of people that are just going to be naturally opposed to you because change is hard. And those two things keep me on like the, the track of let's get what we can, as much as we can, as long as we can, then regroup, let's come back and, and be okay with the fact that you may not get everything on the first bite. And civic organizations put so much time and effort and energy in, I hope that, that, that they feel like they get somewhere even if it's not all the way to the finish line every time because it matters. It does matter also that you feel like something is happening. Uh, you seem to have a very rational approach to, to most aspects of these intricate issues. Well, the emotional side of my character has been tempered by the rational need to get something done. <laughs> uh, you mentioned the word fertilizer and the nitrogen came into my head. It, it's blamed for a lot of algae blooms and uh, other uh, diminished wildlife populations and so on. Um, do you have any, uh, what would you like to see done regarding the nitrogen? System? So I think the, so if you take a look at the analysis that the Peconic Estuary Program did a number of years back, it looks like the, if you look at the nitrogen budget for the Peconic Estuary, you're looking at about 50% of the nitrogen that enters that estuary coming from waste, some septic systems, wastewater, so that's sewage plants, household systems. About 25% of that you really can't do much about its atmospheric deposition. So this is nitrogen that's traveling in the atmosphere and it rains out. You know, that's kind of a relatively, un I mean, if you buy an electric car, there are things that you can do sort of globally to try to work with that, but that's not a local issue that can be handled, right? About 17% um, of the nitrogen entering the estuary is agricultural related. And it may have changed a little bit because some of the ag is converted to residential, but it's in that neighborhood. You're talking about farmers or landscapers yeah. or both? Uh, well, it could be horticultural, it, it could be row crops, things like that. Um, but generically, a agriculture, and then you have um, residential homes and golf courses. Residential homes are about seven percent, I think, and golf courses are about three or four. So you might say, well, seven percent, you know, is that really a big deal? Well, every time I go get my blood pressure checked, the doctor tells me what a seven percent increase will do for me, and it looks like a real number, right? So I think it does matter, and I think we should be focused on it. I think the principal thing we can do is to try to work with, and we're, do we're working on a bill right now in the state that would help people have a chance to vote for the creation of a long-term revenue source to help them change out their septic systems and have it be paid for, you know, so that they don't have to expend any money to get it done. And I think that's probably the way home. There's 360,000 systems in Suffolk County. Let's say we want to prioritize half of them. It's a fair amount of work we have to do to kind of re-engineer the wastewater system that we have. And the wastewater system, and I, I say this as a guy who used to work for, the, work for the health department, originally there wasn't a full understanding as to what the consequences were of nitrogen getting into uh, the marine environment. So the systems were designed largely so that you and I could drink our well water and not consume more than 10 milligrams per liter of nitrogen, and that was considered healthy. Uh, and this, the, so the regulations that we have were really based on kind of human health standards. The environmental health issue only emerged, I'd say, in great, for this area, you know, in the last 10 or 15 years. But now we've learned that you know, half a milligram extra of nitrogen in those marine waters can sometimes cause issues. So we have, a, that system is out of balance. I think the most important thing we can do is to try to work on replacing the wastewater systems that we have with advanced technology, and those systems are now, the county has like half a dozen of them available. There's an industry that's grown up around it. If we have the funding that's there, people can hopefully get it paid for to put it in. 
that's going to be 50 percent. You know, or if you take out the sewage treatment plants, it's 42 percent or something of all the nitrogen that's getting into the estuary will be significantly attenuated by that change alone. Uh, I know that in agriculture, with Cornell and other people, that there's efforts going in to try to, and you know, it's a cost issue too. I mean, farmers don't want to burn money on fertilizer that they don't need, right? So better fertilizers, slow release fertilizers, um, a lot of biodynamic farming where you're, you know, you're tilling less and you're sort of building the soil over time. All of those improved practices are, are very important. And we like, you know, I know the agricultural community, the more they can do that, the healthier their soil will be, the healthier the soil is, the more plants it will grow. And so once you get it going, I think it makes a lot of sense. And the public also is asking for products that have less chemical, you know, whether it's pesticides or fertilizers or whatever. So I think there's, the market is actually helping to drive that change. And then, you know, the residential lawn issue, this gets back to my point earlier. I'm amazed, like in my other East Marion, in my subdivision. I'm just amazed what the amount of energy, finance, you know, treasure that people put into they long, and a good number of them are not here, you know, maybe in weekends, but I just don't think we need to do all this. I mean, I, call me crazy, but I just kind of feel like the amount of stuff that we're putting down all the time to try to make the thing look a certain way that we have in our mind's eye as to what it's supposed to look like is, it's, you know, in some way, and I, I don't want to demean anybody's desire to have, a, have an attractive property. What, I, what I'm trying to say is, in some cases, there are consequences to that that are not fully understood. You, know, you hire a landscaper, you tell them you want it to look like X, Y, Z, they go out, they make it look like you know, they rainfall and all this stuff washes down. That's a problem. So less fertilizer is better. We do have a fertilizer prohibition in Suffolk County between the months of November and April. Uh, you're not allowed to put things, so maybe a little enforcement on that or education on that issue. Uh, that's, a, that's a positive step. Trying to, you know, again, uh, Enhancing the soil under your grass makes the grass grow better and hold moisture longer as opposed to just putting fertilizer on it, which makes the tops green and the roots don't go anywhere. You know, you need to you need to build a root system, you need to build a soil system. And I get that people don't spend a lot of time thinking about that. But honestly, it would be a very good investment to improve the health of our yards rather than simply trying to put something on them that makes them look good for a while. And it's it's a one shot every time. I don't think many homeowners uh, realize that that's an option to the, to the fertilizer. Is there some way of educating them? Yes, and there's organizations. Um, there's um, Perfect Earth, which is out of the South Fork. I just met some people over the weekend who are working on this. You know, we do some sort of basecaping work with, with trying to educate people about, you know, the, again, using native plants, less fertilizer, less management, less pesticides. We know the deer eat just about everything. So, you know, spending a ton of money on plants that the deer come and finish off for you the next weekend, like all of that stuff. Uh, Cornell, I think, also has some training and information on this. So it's, it is, a, it's, it, the biggest challenge is many people that come here are, are, are urban migrants, right? They, they live in an urban setting. They come out here and they say, hire a landscape. The landscape says, okay, we can make it look like this, whatever. It's just not something that comes up on, on your radar. If you're not, if you're not doing it all the time or you didn't grow up with the knowledge of it, you're like, I don't know, I want it to look nice. So. A big part of that really is education, and the second part of it is sort of shifting the paradigm a little bit about what does the, um, what does a nice lawn mean? What does it look like? Like a healthy lawn that supports birds and animals and maybe a little brown or have different kinds of grass growing in it can be beautiful. I mean, I, I was lucky and I grew, where I grew up in Connecticut. It's kind of weird. It was a barn my father turned into a house that was right on the edge of the road. So on, on occasion, we would have a car come through the living room, which is a true story, <laughs> two or three times. However. Setting that aside, the back of that property, which sloped down to a wooded wetland and a, a, a red maple elm swamp that went probably 500 acres in either direction, was absolutely beautiful to me as a kid. And it was fantastic, and you know we never did anything; we just grew. But that's what I grew up seeing: is like my backyard, had, and it had all kinds of life. And we had wood ducks, and we had you know there were beaver back there. It was amazing. It was like going to the zoo. So I had that like jungle book background where I would go down and sit by the edge of the stream and the trout would swim by. It was amazing, right? This is just a suburb outside of Danbury, Connecticut. But if you don't have that and you don't have any other frame of reference, the frame of reference that you have is a very, in Lo it's Long Island centric. I mean, Long Island's culture, of, you know, whether it was Levittown or whatever, that's a very kind of manicured uh, lawn and, you know, the trees that are messy or crooked or whatever, we take them out and put in straight trees. It's just cultural. So I think a lot can be done to kind of, you know, shift. And one of the reasons why we take people outside and into the woods, whether, you know, for, for classes or whatever, is when you start to have that experience of that kind of beauty, 
and you're not afraid to have it near your dwelling, you know, you can you can see the difference. And I'm not asking, I don't think people should, you know, just have to like, you know, huddle in the woods. But think about what you're putting down. And you're usually the closest person to it. Your pets are and that kind of thing. So every time I see all those signs sort of stuck around in my neighborhood, I don't know what that is, you know? Uh, but it's they're telling me there's something that they put down there that I should know about. And it makes me think about what is really going on in that property. And what can I do really to just, just kind of lay back a little bit? I mean, I and believe me, you go by my house, it's not going to surprise you. It is not an award-winning one. It's green in the summer. It gets gray and brown in August. My house came with an irrigation system, and I do irrigate it from time to time. Um, and I don't do anything to it except put a little bit of um, like compost down like every three years or something. And that's it. And again, it's, it's okay. Like driving by, you wouldn't notice that it has 19 different kinds of grass growing in it. But I, I'm okay with that. I don't want to spend the money here. So I just, you know, we just ask the people, like, just again, tap the brake a little bit, step back, and ask yourself whether or not one are you happy spending a ton of money trying to make it look a certain way. When, it, when nature doesn't, you know, if nature's pushing back hard enough, sometimes it's worth listening. You know, like just see what can grow there and, and, and stay with that. And I think that will actually attenuate some of the nitrogen coming from. From that particular source, <coughs> excuse me, in this in this um, in this watershed, and that's good, and that's really all we can ask. I uh, <clears throat> I'm a proponent of letting uh, the dandelions grow if they help the bees. <laughs> I'm Italian. My grandfather spent half his life like picking dandelions. Yeah, my, my wife is doing it recently. <clears throat> and I I can't do it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, that that's the last question I had. Uh, can you tell people how to get in touch with the East End? Yeah, the easiest the easiest way is, you know, you just Google us, Group for the East End, we're groupfortheeastend.org. Um, you go to that website, it has information about, about becoming a member of the projects that we're working on, the different things that we do, where we operate. Um, we also have, you know, we're on Instagram, Facebook, and all that, but I think if you, that's the main place to start. And, you know, we are a nonprofit organization. We're supported solely by membership contributions, and those contributions allow us to be around and do what we do. So the more members we have, the happier we are, and it allows us to keep the lights on. So that's always good. You feel so moved, you know. But it's really, um, you know, it's, it's just, it's a, it is a pleasure to do this work. I have to say because I, I, you know, and people get, I have like, you know, I, my kids are in their twenties, and from time to time, the perspective on people is not so great, and you can understand why, <laughs> because if you're just inundated with media all day, you would not think that people are so great. But you know these groups that get together, yours and others. I mean, it's it's a, it's great that we have this, and there are communities where there is no civic discourse, and you can tell, and it's much harder to get things done. So uh, my hats off to, to your organization and also other civics and uh, and actually the organized Southwest civics, which is a layer on top of that. You know that's a that's a great thing too. That uh, coming together as a coalition, <clears throat> going to town board, you know, a bunch of organizations all have the same point of view, mm -hmm. makes their life a lot easier. So yeah. I thank you for. Well, thank you. I, I feel like uh, you're a great asset. You and the group are a great asset to the area. And, uh, thank you for everything you do. Good. Great to be here.